yeah, I don't know, Andrew and I have sort of concertedly not prepped too much for this. Um, kind of wanted it to be, yeah, um, you know, we're going to talk about following energy. <laughs> this part of what we're going to talk about. And yeah. So we figured we would um, do rather than just talk about. Um, and so we'd sort of see what happened in the space in real time. Um, and usually we start our following energy sessions with a grounding. So I thought we might do that if you're all open to it. Um, yeah, sit however feels comfortable to you. Um, if you want to close your eyes, you're more than welcome to do that. Sometimes it's easier to get in touch with what's going on inside of us um, when we do that. Uh, but a soft gaze is fine too. And um, when you're ready, just, you know, you can start to notice your voice, your, uh, <laughs> okay. I'm going to ground myself first. You can start to notice your breath in your body. And just start to pay attention to how it's moving your chest. Maybe it's moving your stomach or your shoulders up and down. And then starting to imagine that you can breathe just into every part of your body you know, maybe out into your fingers, all the way down into your toes. And then imagine that you could breathe all the way down through the floor, through this building, down to the ground below us, sending some breath down to the original people who cared for this land for so long many different tribes in this area, saying thank you and hello, and then all the way down just into the heart of the earth that is molten lava, just connecting our hearts with the heartbeat of this incredible, incredible earth <sighs> that, you know, I really think that Andrew's photos honor that connection in a lot of ways, so just honoring Earth, each of us, and our own relationship to her and to it. And then feeling maybe some of that Earth energy comes back up through all those layers into your body, and just see, just play, what would it feel like to maybe have some Earth inside of you? Maybe it feels still or quiet, and just however it feels to you to connect with the natural world filling you up all the way to the top of your head. And if there's any extra earth energy, it can just come out the top of your head and waterfall back down around you, like golden light. And some reciprocity, you know, really giving back to the earth, not just taking like a continuous flow that we're in with her. And then from that grounded place, Again, opening up, imagining the top of your head maybe can open and receive, you know, go up and say hello to the sky and our sun and our moon and the planets and way out to the universe. Catch yourself a star maybe to say hello and thank you so much to the way that the stars shine down on us and, you know, so many have been captured in these beautiful images that Andrew's made today. And, sort of feeling us, you know, looking out and then looking back at us with a lot of wisdom and grace. And again, just what might it feel like for some of that sky energy to twinkle down into you like starlight and stardust coming back down into your body and filling you up. And again, if there's any extra sky energy, it can just go out your pores and go back into the sky with gratitude. Mm. And then finding a balance between that earth and sky inside of you in just an instant and just noticing where does that balance land for you today in your body. And from that balanced point, imagining that you can send your awareness out in all directions, saying hello to east and south and west and north and then back below and above, and then finding all those points come together inside of you, that seventh point where we connect to the deepest of mystery and the unknown and also our deep wisdom and intuition. 
And I just ask that all those points come together to create a really safe and sacred container for us today so that only the energy for the highest good with the clearest vibration may enter here where all these beloveds are gathered to help us yeah, just honor and get to know and talk about and share you know, this process that Andrew's been through to make all these beautiful photographs and the way we worked together and just really honoring that process of following energy and all the teachers that came forward to support us, fear and awareness and choice and body and intuition, energy and tension and surrender and birth ultimately again. And I especially just really want to honor Stacey Bowden, who's here with us, my incredible mentor and teacher who really caught these ways and you know created this book turning dead ends into doorways over a decade ago and trained me and some other people here in this room to be able to carry this beautiful lineage and yeah bring it to touch people like Andrew um, and help him make you know some beautiful creative things in the world and I'm just so so grateful and honored to be here and you know have this group together in this way to honor all of these ways so thank you so much, each and every one of you, for being here. It's a real pleasure and an honor. <sighs> yeah, and then when you're ready, come back into your body and start to notice your breath again. And yeah, slowly open your eyes and come back into the room together. Mm. Yeah, welcome, welcome. Um, yeah, like where do we, where do you want to go? Um, yeah, yeah, I'll go. Yeah, please. Um, I think it was November of last year. Mm. So it was like exactly a year ago, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, well, actually, let me back up and say that Mickey is the kind of person who puts Zoom calls on your calendar. <laughs> like, and it is like, I want to check in with you. At like unsolicited, like if this works, great. And for years we've been doing that. Like you haven't let me drift. <laughs> and that happens, right? It happens that we just sort of drift. And it's not because we think any less, it's just because, I don't know, we don't use our tools properly or something. And you're, you, you just started putting Zoom calls on my calendar and I would always take them. Because even if I was like between meetings and we were working from home or whatever, I was like, I want to, because I also want to be the guy, I, like I want to live in a way in which like I pick up the phone when someone calls. Like I just think that's a good way to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and you were calling. And so for years we've had a kind of um, soft tissue connecting us mm -hmm. uh, that, that um, was sort of sweet and dormant, but nothing, no ex real expectations. Yeah. Uh, and nef nothing to uh, the degree of, uh, of kind of, um, I don't know, clarity that we had 10, 12 years ago when we were both kind of working in the photo space and trying to create a photography festival and iterating on different ideas. I mean, 2008 um, was a really difficult time in photography. I just want to be clear about that. Mm -hmm. Because when the economy collapsed, newspapers and magazines yeah dried up, fund, lost their funding, and so photographers did not know where to go to find support. And it was also the moment in which digital tools really became a serious challenger to film. So 2008 was a, a really volatile time in the history of professional photography, and we were in our late 20s, essentially, trying to create a new model um, within an existing framework. So I was uh, working closely in the, under the sort of shadow of National Geographic and that rich legacy of photography that was quickly about to be outdated. And you were working in a sort of, in the magazine realm as, a, as an editor yeah. and a blogger. Which was, which was also ready to be outdated, like, you know, right. the magazine went away after a couple of years. But you were like, no, blogging is for real. But the blog, yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of people at that time were kind of like, well, blogging is like, you know, low, like a, a sub, you know, a junior level of like real journalism. So anyway, we, we met each other at this moment of change uh, and like energy for something different. Yeah. And we had a very specific set of years in which we got to do that. Mm -hmm. And Sarah was part of that. 
and Dad, yeah. you were part of that when we created Look Between in 2010, mm -hmm. which was a, an emerging photographers festival. And um, and then in 2013, I moved out here mm -hmm. and got swept up into the world of Instagram, and and all of a sudden I went from being part of a kind of uh, no budget nonprofit arts <laughs> festival, skin your teeth, call your dad, ask him to you know. <laughs> Put up priceless artworks, even though you have you're not an art handler, right? <laughs> right. But like that was the spirit of it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the world of Instagram was like, you have unlimited resources. Mm -hmm. And so I, that was cool. And they, they, and and so we we went in these separate directions. But you were out here. Yeah. You had come out in to San Francisco in that spirit of entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. the spirit of launching something, and this is a city that launches things, which I love. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so now we're kind of coming back. Yeah. But it was in November, after you know, quarterly, maybe once a quarter, yeah. you know, every three months, sort of check-ins. How are you doing? What's going on? That you said, hey, I'm moving down a new path mm -hmm. with this framework, with this ancient women's wisdom, this, mm -hmm. um, and I would like to work with you. Mm -hmm. And again, it's like, I gotta pick up the phone and answer that call, but I was not ready to commit. Mm -hmm. I was a little skeptical. It just, it, it was a lot, it was a big offer, you know? Yeah. Um, and, then, and then you actually, I think you did the thing that set the tone, it was like, you know what, let me stop talking about it, and let's just do a session. Mm -hmm. right? we sort of, you kind of followed the energy, right? Because mm -hmm. trying to explain it didn't really make sense. Um, and, you know, I have a, I mean, I have a therapist, I and mean, I've been working with a therapist, you know, that I, for several years, and it's been, it's been good, it's been helpful. So I was like, That's another therapist? Like, are, is that what this is? Like, do I really need two therapists? <laughs> But you never were offering therapy. But I didn't, you know, like I said, I was just I was being introduced to this idea of like following the energy. I was like, okay. Um. <laughs> but, but we did a session, and at the end of it, I was like, well, that's obviously going to happen. Like, that's obviously the next thing that's going to happen. Um, and, and I told you, I said, uh, sorry, this is kind of a long preamble, but I think there's a lot of interesting stuff here, which is just that I'm, I've been working in tech startups since I left Instagram, and there's this cycle within the tech world, which is exciting, but also kind of brutal, of a, a new idea gets rapidly funded and is evaluated way beyond its existing real world value. Mm -hmm. And so you spin up teams, you hire people, you move really fast around a core idea, and then you get more funding in the, like, I'm talking about like hundreds of millions of dollars here, and there's no actual real product. <laughs> I just want to be clear about that. <laughs> and what happens is at some point, you have to then make a real thing. And it gets really crunchy, and you stop hiring people, and you start making tough decisions, and ultimately you start to pare back, and you let go of the sort of uh, marginal ideas because you have to focus on real users, real using like your product. Mm -hmm. And so there's this cycle of hiring and firing. And one of the beauty thing, beautiful things, is that you get severance when you get fired. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's really a cycle of yeah. like of like hiring and firing. Yeah. Um, and there's really no shame in this town of getting fired, which is mm -hmm. great. And I knew that there was a high likelihood that in six months, in June, that I would either be fired or I was going to leave because we were reaching a stage with this company in which it was not performing, it was not catching on, and uh, I'm not an engineer, mm -hmm. so I'm disposable. But companies bring me on at the beginning stages of their ideas because I help them create a visualization of what it can be if people use it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that I can program a million users using it, but I help set uh, a kind of aspirational vision. Mm -hmm. 
And then once that's set, I become a little bit more disposable, mm. which is actually fine. And I knew that moment was coming, and you did too, mm -hmm. because in November you said, I have a six month <laughs> course path for us if you're open to it. Mm -hmm. And after that visualization, I was like, yeah, this is going to take me to June at that moment in which I'm going to, I know I'm going to have to make a choice. Mm -hmm. um, and so you said, please set an intention mm -hmm. for the work. And I fished around a little bit for one word. <laughs> that was some of your instructions, which was, I think intentions are best if they're a single word. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, and, you know, I'm like, I'm a, you know, I was like, I know that like a good tight edit is important if you're talking. To you. <laughs> so I was like, one word, one, we can do this. And um, and actually, on the other side of this room, the the the, the, the library, um, there's a, there's the wall of books that faces out, and then there's the wall of books that are the spines. And those two are meant to be next to each other because it's how I process the light, the, the sort of inventory. I pull things out and I look for connections. And after you invited me, I did that with, the, with that, and I pulled out a book that I've been carrying around since college that I have not, I didn't read it in college and I still hadn't read it, but I kept it with me. And it's a book by a theologian named Paul Tillich, um, or Tillich out of Yale, and it's a series of lectures called The Courage to Be. And I was like, courage, that's a good one. And then as I started reading, one of the first things he says is that the word courage comes from the ancient Greeks who needed a word for like manliness in battle. Mm -hmm. And that word is Andrew. Uh, oh, mm -hmm. wow. <laughs> it's basically Andrew. It's like A N D R E I with like, but like the root of my name is, and I've always known that it was manliness, and I was like, that's such a weird definition of a name. But like in the, in the name books, you know, I was like, oh, what does that mean? You know, looks like mine said manliness, and I was like, well, that doesn't check out. But, but now it's actually, it's like, oh, it's actually courage. And so I, I said, I said, actually, that was pretty easy. Yeah. I said, that was a pretty easy exercise. It's courage. <laughs> yeah. Let's go with it. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to pause there because yeah. that's, for me, the origin story of how this came together. Yeah. Well, yeah, I wonder if we should pause and say a little bit about intentions um, and why they're an important part of following energy, um, which is that, uh, you know, the idea of of following energy, uh, uh, you know, I could I could say this a hundred different ways, but um, what's coming to me now is that, um, you know, it's I think it's kind of this idea of like the, of learning to turn ourselves into like a radio tuner, right? So sort of moving away from this idea of some kind of force of will, right? Or like I'm gonna think of a thing and then make it happen, right? And more like. Uh, there's energy all around us, there's energy in our bodies, there's energy in the world, and how do I tune into what's sort of here, right? What's coming towards me, what's already flowing, what's inside of me, right? Like what I'm excited about and what my dreams are, and sort of find some point, right, that can then move me through life in a way that feels generative and playful and exciting, but also moves me towards things that I really want and love and care about, right? Um, and so when we set an intention, um, part of it is that we're, we're sort of telling the energy, like this is, this is where I want to go, this is what I want to pay attention to, this is what I want to be in relationship with, right? Like this is an archetype or an energy that I want to get to know better. Um, so that it can become in internalized and I can learn to embody it, right, in a different way. Um, and so when we have something like a six-month journey, um, setting an intention, it sort of, you know, it, it gives you something to pay attention to and it focuses the energy, right? It sort of um, gives us a direction to go in. And so, but it's a journey, right? And so as we move through these teachers, these eight teachers that I mentioned at the beginning, right, fear, awareness, choice, body, intuition, energy, intention, surrender, and then ultimately birth and rebirth, um, we sort of, we meet each of them through the lens of this intention that you set, right, mm -hmm. in this right. journey. And so I'm curious for you, like, 
how did, how did you get to know the intention of courage during that journey and beyond, right? Because it's still with you here. Like, how did it change? How did your understanding of it change? How did it come to sort of live inside of you? You know, I have to say that one of the hardest things about our six months together was feeling connected to that intention. Mm -hmm. Like it didn't always make, it wasn't really that clear to me. Mm -hmm. Like I kept coming back to courage and being like, yeah, okay, courage, courage. And like, uh, I, I liked it. Also, I just also want to say that when I, when I said courage to you, you were like, I love that word because the French word cour is yeah. heart, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So courage feels also about like a shift from a kind of uh, cerebral experience of the world into you know, one that comes from the heart. So that, that was also really sweet. And, and I would say for me, it's actually much more clear now that this is the courage part. Like these photographs presented to my friends and my community in this space, like, I mean, that was like, I, 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 I hit that like in September. I was like, oh, courage is showing up now, not as much in February, in March. Mm -hmm. As we were exploring these different teachers, it was always close, but it was kind of like it was it was it was a, it was a one ring out, you know. Mm -hmm. But now this is like this is the courage. I mean, even just sitting in front of my family and friends, you know, and like the recording <laughs> is like is like a is and and um, and I also you know I think Sarah and Rachel really have been essential to me feeling held. For, to be courageous, you know? Mm -hmm. And we had a meeting in your backyard. When, when was that? Was that? Over a month ago. Yeah, but it was like less than six two. Maybe yeah. six weeks ago. Yeah. Where none of this existed. And we just, like, Rachel was like, I'm opening a spreadsheet and we're going to write stuff down. <laughs> right? And we just started going. And I was like, oh, I don't have to be courageous alone. Like, that's mm -hmm. the coolest thing. I was like, oh. And I know all these people, and then we formed a team, the three of us, and the four of us. So, yeah, for me, it's like also courage is not manliness in battle. Like, it is uh, about the kind of courage to ask your, like, your beloveds and your friends, and to be like, hey, can I make this with you? Can we do this together? And for them to see you, and for you to see them. So, that to me is how I'm processing courage mm. right now. It might shift and change as it, as it, as it did earlier, but yeah, that's how, what it means to me now. Yeah, yeah, of course. I often see on the journey with intentions I've set my own, obviously. Mine is showing up in service, and so it, it was funny, too, that so much of your, you know, it was coming up for you was sort of like stepping out and being seen, right? Like yeah. being seen as a photographer, literally people seeing your images, and. I think that that showing up and being seen for me has been a big thing this year and in a lot of my life and so there was that resonance there but yeah I often see following intentions that there's often a part in the process where uh, you're learning the most about the intention because you feel the furthest from it right like it'll sort of show up as the opposite of the thing that you set an intention for and that, that teaches us a lot right and mm -hmm. there's usually like a cycle of sort of coming back to it and it, it feels different in your body, you know, or it comes in in a different way later on. Mm -hmm. So that's beautiful. Um, I have lots of questions, but you said something about you wanted to ask me some things too. Do you want to? Um... Mm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess one thing I've never asked you is why you wanted to stay close to me. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny you were saying that thing about how I, I wouldn't let you drift. Um, I don't know where that comes from in me, but I think it's one of my, it's it's part of my genius, right? We've talked about genius, Michael Mead, who I think I introduced you to, right? Totally, yeah. Um, I'd like but, to talk about that, too. We'll yeah, Karen Carper introduced me to another friend of ours. Um, he has, he's a you know a writer and a mythologist, and he has a great podcast um, that you should all look at if you haven't. And Andrew started listening to him, and he talks a lot about the idea of genius, right? Of that, like we come into this world with some unique mix of qualities and understandings, and then we have experiences, and that we each bring something really special and specific, right? And that then part of our job as a human is to find where that meets the needs of the world around us, right? 
and then sort of bring that together. And I don't know, but my like part of my genius I know is finding amazing people and just not letting them go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, I just, like I just won't let them drift too far um, and yeah you know um, we got to collaborate together and um, I think that forms a bond and uh, not everyone is a great collaborator um, and that was such a formative experience for me getting to do look between with you and Jenna and Sarah and you know the whole crew was there and um, and then, yeah, and then it just felt really like kismet that you like came to San Francisco. Oh, and right, right. Like I remember before you got the Instagram job, like Jackson and I were like, oh, we, you gotta, we gotta reposition this, this resume of yours. We gotta talk about growth and we gotta talk about, you know, like whatever. And then of course you like, you know, ended up at like outpacing, you know, all of that, like so much. Um, and I don't know, I just, I, I don't know. It's an entirely intuitive thing. Mm. I just, sense people that are like deep and are, I don't know, leading with their heart, you know, um, and that care about the things I care about um, and the world and uh, yeah, and this work that I'm doing now, I just really want to make sure that those people get to be seen and heard um, and get to be part of making the new version of our world that I think we need so badly out there. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm lucky. Yeah, yeah. I feel, feel really privileged by that. Yeah. Um, let's see, I want I wanted you to tell a little story. Yeah. Because there's so many amazing stories. You came back with all these amazing stories. Um, you've told a bunch of stories about these photos, so I don't want you to tell any of those, because those we've done already. Okay, okay. Um, there's a couple, though, that, because, you know, a lot of these photos are sort of where you, you found flow. Right, like mm. you sort of you you found it and you were with it and you followed the energy and you got to these moments. I'm a little more interested in some of the blockers that mm. came early on. I was thinking because you know that's part of the process. It's like we always see the end. Like we're like, oh, you made these amazing things, but the creative process is one of hitting walls and seeing your limits and sort of moving beyond them. I was thinking about the the water and the truck. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like getting to the edge of the water. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a cool story. You want to tell that? Yeah, I'd love to tell that story. So, um, a lot of this work is about water. It, it's from, I made these pictures from April to August, um, basically for the first four months of last year, atmospheric rivers made landfall in California and just completely changed the hydrology of the state. And the hydrology is really what controls so much. I mean, I. I think political elections mm -hmm. depend on whether or not there's water, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the Central Valley, um, which is so core to California, even though us coastal elites often are, uh, you know, thought of as like looking down on the Central Valley, but the Central Valley is such a key part of um, how this state works, and the. To Larry Lake, um, reformation is one of the ama most amazing stories of this past year. Mm -hmm. uh, the largest freshwater lake west of the Mississippi is basically north of Bakersfield. But it was drained and diverted uh, about 100 years ago and became some of the most pristine farmland in America. But it is not the ancient pathway of water to be diverted like that. And so when we had so much rain and all this snow and the snow melt, that water wanted to return to its natural course, which is north of Bakersfield. <laughs> and so uh, it, is a, it is a catastrophe in the town of Corcoran, which is also a maximum security prison. Uh, it's a very intense place. Um, and you have one of the most impressive Migratory bird, migratory bird stops on Tulare Lake, a maximum security prison, um, basically cattle farms, dairy farms. It's a really wild, dynamic place. And I was super interested in the ways in which all the snow melt from the Sierra Nevada this winter melted, flew uh, off of the waterfalls in Yosemite, merged with the Merced River, merged with the Sacramento River, and then basically like spread out in the Central Valley. All that, so uh, 
there, there's basically barns, farms, like millions of dollars of agricultural equipment that is now all below the water level of Tulare Lake. And I am pretty good at ignoring or avoiding road closure signs. I'll just drive right around them. <laughs> and you have to do that to make these kinds of photographs. You can't, like, you, the, the highway patrol's job is to protect personal, you know, to A, not be liable, and B, to like, protect the public. But like, I, what I'm trying to do here can't stay on the other side of these boundaries that, you know, administrative, administrators are creating. So I drove around the road closure barrier within literal vision, uh, within eyesight of the maximum security prison, uh, and drove to the edge of where Tulare Lake is, is like its, its, its current boundary in, I don't know, this summer sometime, mm -hmm. June, July. Basically, there's asphalt, and then there's just water. <laughs> and, the, and like, there, you know, it's, it, and, it, and it's, um, it's an inland sea. It's like, it is, it's what it used to be. It's sort of starting to reform that. And it's such an amazing moment of like, it's, it's been in the news. I mean, you can find these pictures. This is like a super easy picture to make for photojournalists. You walk up and it's like, oh look, there's the road and the water. And like, this looks like climate change. It's a very cliche picture in some ways. Um, and I got to the edge and I was like, well, this is as far as I can go. Okay, like, what can I do here at this edge that doesn't feel cliche? And I tried and I, I don't know, I was there at a cool hour, the light was interesting. And I did my best and I got in the car and I started driving home. And it's about a four hour drive. And halfway through the trip, I got hit with this lightning bolt insight. That was the only reason I didn't move any further down the road is because I didn't have the right shoes on. <laughs> I didn't want my feet to get wet. Mm. I was like, wait, what? I didn't cross that boundary simply because of my footwear. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I realized, I was like, I have Crocs in the car. <laughs> Like, all I needed to do was change into something that was better for water, and I could have kept going. It's not like it was like a drop-off, a hundred feet. It was like two inches of water covering the road that made it seem like it didn't, there was no more road, but the road was still there. It just was slightly submerged. And I literally almost turned around and was like, I'm going to pay for my sins, and I'm going like, to make this photograph. And I didn't. I thought better of it. I was like, that's not following energy. Mm. I need to keep going. I also had deadlines. I had to go back to work, things like that. But it was this amazing moment for me of like, oh, I carry a certain bias. I, I carry certain rules. I carry certain expectations um, that prevent me sometimes from just stepping into the better picture. Mm -hmm. I let myself hit a wall that didn't actually exist. Mm -hmm. And I actually had the equipment to keep going. It was just, I couldn't even just take my shoes off. Um, so that was really important. That was a really great, like, damn, but okay. Mm -hmm. Like, there was a certain grace to that moment of like, well, next time. Also, that lake is going to be there for three years. <laughs> like, it's not going anywhere for a while. Um, so yeah, that's, thanks for recalling that memory because that was a fun one. Tough at the time. Yeah. But, um, but, a, but a good one. Yeah. Well, and I wonder if that kind of brings us to the Michael Mead piece because to me, like that, like those moments, right, that we have in our life, it's like, uh, that's a particular insight about making photographs, right? Yeah. But I think that there is also a larger insight for you there, and I hope I'm not like divulging too much, right, about your personal process, but I, I think it was also like, where are all the places that I create boundaries for myself that they, they don't actually exist, right? Like, where are all the places we all do that, right, where we assume that we have to stop, right? Yeah. Um, and actually we can keep going, and 
I think that's sort of like um, the, the way that things become analogies or they become a metaphor, right, for something larger, something physical and discrete becomes a metaphor for something larger is part of what Michael Mead talks a lot about and this idea of like the mythological, right, and how we've lost this sense of, we've gotten very obsessed with logos, right, with things that we can measure and see and, and you know, metrics and, um, and we've sort of lost the idea of mythos, which is, the stories we tell about the things, right? Like the meaning that we give to things, the meaning that piles up on things over time, right? Um, the things that become rituals to us. Um, and, you know, this, like to me, this weekend is like such a beautiful example of that, right? There's mm -hmm. like these, like, like you, you had this realization, right? That like Sarah and you and I, and even your dad had like worked together on, like between like whatever, 12, 13 years ago, right? And we're like together in this space again. And like, how much more does it mean that there are these like resonances and like, oh, where were you 13 years ago? And right, we were like different people and everything we've been through in that interim, right? And, um, and yeah, I'm like having people here, you know, that I, you know, have like from other parts of our lives. Mm -hmm that come in and how it sort of builds the sense of meaning on top of things. And I think that really informed kind of how you were thinking about making photos too, right? And sort of the process and the images. And yeah, yeah. And you know, maybe maybe I'll talk a little bit about the camera, because uh, mm. I think um, that ties in with the sort of, the, the, the sort of, the realm of mythology. Mm. And I, I kind of want to be clear about mythology for a second. And this, I'm new, to, I'm sort of new to this. Um, <laughs> But you turned me on to this podcast uh, from Michael Mead called Living Myth. Um, and it was, a, it was a, a, an essential part of my kind of auditory landscape as I was driving in to make this work, in which he really comes from a philosophy and, and poetry background and thinking and presenting, um, yeah, I mean, he says, he says that there are only, in mythology, and I don't mean like Greek mythology. I'm not talking about, I, don't, I don't mean Zeus and Athena and those kind of those stories. Um, the idea that mythology has there are two great stories. One is the unfolding drama of the cosmos, mm -hmm. the the realm of nature that is always in a cycle of death and and, and creation, recreation, and that it's and it's out, we're outside of that. And then the other story of mythology, the other great story, is the story of the individual soul, the story of the individual trying to bring out the story of one's own life. Um, and for me, this became a really rich, um, like a really rich idea to apply to the camera. I'm just, in this in this work specific, I was really interested in can the camera tell a more mythological story? Because the camera in in the tradition that I was raised in, and Peter too, and even you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and Heather, I think you as a camera work were definitely trying to build a bridge between these different ways in which the camera operates. But I came from the National Geographic tradition, which is, it better be verifiable, we're going to have a fact checker, um, and uh, we're, it's going to be consumable, you know, it's going to go into a magazine. And uh, I was not really ever interested in making those kinds of pictures. I never really wanted to be a newspaper photographer or a magazine photographer. But my job, literally, was to elevate those photographers. It was my job to celebrate the icons of that documentary tradition. But I was never like, it wasn't like my, my bag. I don't know. And so when it came time for me to really work on my own stuff, the, I, and bring my own vision, which is often what we as artists are kind of expected to do. There's a lot of pressure. Like, well, what's your take on this, right? What's your unique genius on this? Right, which is why when I was at the edge of Tulare Lake, I was like, I, I can't make a better picture than what I've already seen. Mm -hmm. But that's a kind of logos approach. Mm -hmm. So for me, the mythology side of it was like, oh, well, how can I make, how can I ask the camera to show that mythological point of view on the world? Mm -hmm. um, and to be very, to be more specific, 
the camera that I've used for all of these photographs is, um, is a 4x5 film camera, and that is basically in the tradition um, that Ansel Adams used. Um, no, I'm not a devotee of Ansel Adams, I want to be clear about that. Um, he's done significant work, but in terms of like putting a camera on your back, going deep into the wilderness and making large format film, like he's an icon of that. Um, but the amazing thing about those cameras is they have no internal guides. There's no battery, there's no light meter, there's nothing to suggest whether a, a picture is off or on, you know? And that just gave me so much empty space to experiment and to just think in a mythological way. Can I ask this camera to see with me in this sort of mythological realm? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, when I say mythology, I really mean literally like that. I don't mean like, oh, these pictures evoke a kind of mythology. Or like, yeah, isn't that cool that it's sort of related to the cosmos? It was like, no, actually, like, I had this sort of, um, like a compatriot. In some ways, like, my camera was this sort of enabler, and this sort of partner in trying to create a unique vision. Um, and the, the three-hour exposure of the moonrise over Mono Lake is... Um, a picture you can only take in, with film because that camera that we're being recorded on has a battery life of about two hours. <laughs> it literally just isn't up for the job. Um, so, yeah, I just, I like really let myself not be boxed in by invisible barriers. Like, the, the, you know, the story of the shoes and Tulare Lake is this kind of analogous to, oh, like what are other invisible boundaries that I, that I might have around this camera? And how can I push through that a little bit and ask it to do a little bit more? And be totally cool with whatever results might come from it. Um, and then, of course, I can't see the results in the back of the camera. Uh, so I have this process in which I, I mean, one of the most important teachers for us and that we ended on is surrender. And of course, not only was I surrendering my job, um, but in the process of shooting 4x5 film, the boxes of 10, and so these gallery guides uh, are a kind of like um, stand-in for the process of putting 4x5 sheets into the box. But a real literal act of surrender is that this these, photo, these exposed negatives have to be put back into the bag in a dark bag. So when I'm on the road, I set up a little pop-up table, I sit on the bumper of the car, I put on some music, like Kelly's, Kelly's yeah, music. Oftentimes, yeah. I'm in zones with no internet or no Wi-Fi, so all I can have, whatever, whatever five or six albums are in my sort of download in Spotify, I play one of them. And then I stick my hands into a dark bag mm -hmm. that I cannot take my hands out of until the job is done. Mm -hmm. So I like I'm, I'm like you know handcuffed in some ways. Like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm total this total act of surrender mm -hmm. in which I'm moving sheets of film, you know, of these experiments out of the the dark slide and moving it into another dark container and then boxing that up. And then when that's totally done, and I have you know ways of checking to make sure that uh, all of the pictures made it in there, because um, again, if they're exposed to light, then they're ruined, and uh, there's no recourse. And then I pull my hands out, and I take the boxes, and I label them, and I put them in this little fridge that is in the back of the van with me. Um, so yeah, for me, it is um, all of that. I think feels like a system that I built in order to support and enable that idea of like looking through a mythological lens, mm -hmm. like literally, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and because it's not just enough for me to like think that I want to look through a middle of it. I have to actually build a, a system mm -hmm. with all of these components mm -hmm. and these physical pieces of material um, in order to like see it all the way. And then the last piece of that is actually the printing and presentation of it.
Because mm -hmm. it, again, it's like if it's not shared, then we're not here talking about these stories. You know? Yeah, mm -hmm. I love that. I love talking about the bag. Well, I'd like to, if it's okay. Yeah, um, of course. I mean, I'm honestly just kind of sitting here doing my best to just breathe in and bask and receive this moment because it's really kind of a dream come true to have um, someone like Mickey, who I have a, you know, whatever, 14-year relationship with and, you know, is spiritual family to me, you know, um, to have her sitting here after all our years of relationship and study and dedication and to have her holding space for this and facilitating this and her deep relationship that she has earned with following energy to be able to then hold you mm. and hold this and offer this and then to you know hold us all is just like one of those full circle moments for me too of like a dream come true mm. you know and so i'm breathing that in right here right now and receiving it and I know that later today I'm going to be having a great cry of gratitude. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because my intention with following energy has been to be of service to regular people who may want to embody another way of life. So, you know, following energy isn't mine. It comes through my teachers who have worked directly with original peoples, okay? And so I got to study all these crunchy, earth-based ways with them. And then when I started sitting with folks in San Francisco and started talking about this thing, following energy, stay behind the energy, don't get ahead of the energy, they were like, what the hell are you talking about? And it was through that journey that we arrived at these eight teachers. you know. And then that's how I wrote my book. But the purpose of that was to support regular folk, you know, people who weren't necessarily going to be going and sitting on a mountain you know, that way, you know, to be able to access a relationship-based way of life in, in here in San Francisco, where I grew up, like literally five minutes away from here, that we could somehow learn through connecting with the, the wisdom of an intention, which is a heartfelt wish and a capacity that we each get to grow inside of ourselves and daily life. To, to allow it to come alive enough to show us another way, to show us another level of relationship. And so, you know, getting to have this moment and getting to receive you and that you are then embodying it and bringing it out through these incredible, like living pieces of art that are, are in service to earth, mm -hmm. It's just like, <laughs> seriously, thank you. Yeah. You know, and that it's expressing itself with your relationship, because to me, it's like everyone gets to have their own relationship with following energy. I don't presume to know what that is, right? It's an individual journey. And, you know, that you're getting to express it this way out in the world as an offering, um, it's just deeply moving and deeply touching, and then you get to see what that is for you. So, you know, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, thank you, and I love you, McGee. Thank you. Thank you.